It's the year 1940. The whole of Europe is in turmoil with Nazi Germany having already conquered much of the continent. But one stubborn obstacle remains, the United Kingdom. To do so, Hitler and his circle of evils are making a sinister plan to invade and conquer the British islands. On the 16th of July, Hitler issued a directive to start Operation Sea Lion, to begin preparations and, if necessary, to carry out an invasion across the channel of the British Isles. He said that he was preparing this because the British were failing to come to terms. The operation was scheduled for September 1940, but was never carried out and ultimately abandoned. So what made Hitler change his mind? Why did he call off the invasion? Is there anything more to this story? Before we get into the video, please hit the like button to show your love and support. There's a famous saying among historians that the sun never sets on the British Empire. And considering Britain's heyday, this was absolutely true as they controlled territory in practically every corner of the world. At its height in the 19th and early 20th centuries, it was the largest empire in the world and covered almost a quarter of the Earth's land surface, ruling over 458 million people. No other country in history, or the present day for that matter, has managed to exert its influence like the British did. And according to some studies, they were able to invade 90% of the countries across the globe. That's an astonishing feat considering how small they are, don't you agree? But as they say, every great empire has a slow rise and a great fall. And depending on how you look at it, the empire remained alive in some form or another until 1997, when the UK handed Hong Kong, the last significant colony of the British Empire, back to China. However, it wasn't always a powerhouse with global influence. In fact, the British Isles were invaded several times by nations and tribes from all across Europe. The Romans, the Vikings, the Normans, the French, and very recently the Germans during the Second World War have tried to invade it, but the island hasn't been successfully invaded since 1066 AD, and those invaders who did see success had to overcome a lot of challenges to conquer it. In modern times, it has become much harder, or according to some practically impossible, to invade it, which brings us to the question of why it is impossible to invade the United Kingdom. Let's break down the reasons, shall we? The first thing to consider is that the United Kingdom is an island nation, and as a general rule of thumb, island nations are difficult to invade. Being surrounded by water on all sides, specifically the English Channel, the North Atlantic Ocean, and the North Sea, these natural barriers in themselves act as a deterrent for any potential invasion. You see, the island, because of its isolation from the mainland, provides a natural defensive position that makes it very hard to invade. Plus, they also require a significantly greater amount of planning, resources, means of transportation, and personnel in comparison to those needed to invade an area on the mainland. Even during the Second World War, when the Allies invaded Normandy, they faced immense difficulties, and that was with the combined resources of several powerful nations. After all the years of planning and deception, now came the hard part. Landing on beaches, where the troops are most vulnerable. Crossing water to launch a military operation is a very hard thing to do. It's hard enough to cross a river, never mind 40, 50 miles of sea. Many US troops die in the first hail of bullets, with over 3,000 casualties throughout the day. When a German fighter came out of the sky, machine gunning me, and that was my 21st birthday. So I then drove for uh, all between 24 and 48 hours to get to Dunkirk Beach. There we dynamited our lorries, blew them up, and I sat on the beach. No food, no water, for 48 hours. Soldiers just sitting on the beach, because there was nowhere to go, nowhere to hide, completely flat beach. And um, you just sat there, Ships were coming in, getting sunk by German bombers. And you just sat there and hoped that you got away with it. So we can only imagine how difficult it will be in the current times. What makes the invasion even more dreadful are the treacherous waters surrounding the British Isles. In the case of the UK, the shortest distance from its shores to the mainland of Europe is through the English Channel, located here at the Strait of Dover. 
but crossing it is no easy feat as the English Channel is notoriously treacherous, with strong currents and unpredictable weather, and can be a logistical nightmare for any invasion fleet. Even if an invasion force somehow managed to cross the sea, they are in for big trouble as the massive white cliffs of Dover await them, which have long served as a symbolic guard against invasion. The words of Julius Caesar during his invasion of Britain perfectly described Britain in the context of the White Cliffs of Dover as a wild island with giant natural fortification. Another effective barrier is the North Sea, which separates the eastern coast of the UK from continental Europe. It's a large expanse of water stretching over 220,000 square miles and has unpredictable weather and strong currents, which makes it difficult to navigate even to the natives, let alone an invader. What also helps is that the North Sea is surrounded by countries that have historically been friendly with the UK, such as Norway, Denmark, and the Netherlands, thus further reducing the likelihood of a successful invasion via this route. And even if someone tries to carry out one, the North Sea, along with all the surrounding water bodies near the island, is controlled and defended by the very capable and powerful British Royal Navy. The UK's naval presence ensures that any invading fleet would have to contend with not only the unpredictable seas, but also a highly skilled and well-equipped navy ready to defend British shores, which makes any large-scale invasion virtually impossible. But the challenges don't end at sea alone. The UK's inland geography also includes tons of difficult terrain, including rugged mountains, dense forests, and marshlands specifically in Scotland, Wales, and other parts of Northwest Ireland. So even if an invader managed to establish a beachhead, these natural barriers can prove to be a major uphill for invading ground forces by slowing down their movements and making it difficult to control large parts of the country. To add to this, if used strategically, positions such as the Scottish Highlands, the rugged landscape of Wales, the Rocky Mountains and Scaffell Pike, and many other places can make the fight even more difficult as they could serve as excellent defensible positions for the British forces. Speaking of British forces, they too are an important factor on our list of whys, but that we will cover later in the video. First, let's get on with the mother of all reasons, and that's the good old reason of having nukes in your arsenal. The United Kingdom's nuclear journey can be traced back to its involvement in the development of the first atomic weapons during the Second World War. It played a pivotal role in the early phases of nuclear weapon development within the Manhattan Project, a covert initiative led by the United States in collaboration with British scientists including notable individuals like Sir James Chadwick and Rudolf Peierls, who made significant contributions to the project. Following the war in 1950, the UK established the Atomic Weapons Establishment, or the AW, to continue its research and development of nuclear weapons. This effort yielded results on October 3, 1952, when the UK conducted its first successful nuclear test with the detonation of an atomic bomb as part of Operation Hurricane, which made them the third country after the United States and the Soviet Union to possess nuclear weapons. Since then, it has made some considerable progress in its nuclear capabilities. While its nuclear arsenal may not match the size of those possessed by nations like the United States, Russia, China, or France, it remains a formidable deterrent against potential aggressors. At present, the United Kingdom has 225 nuclear warheads under its stockpile, and its current nuclear program is centered around its nuclear deterrent capability, which is maintained through the Trident Nuclear Weapons System. Operated by the Royal Navy and based at Clyde Naval Base on the west coast of Scotland, the program consists of four Vanguard-class submarines that are armed with Trident II D-5 submarine-launched ballistic missiles. While the United Kingdom is responsible for constructing the Vanguard submarines, the United States is in charge of missile production. The principle of Trident's operation is known as Continuous At-Sea Deterrence, or KSD, which means that at least one submarine continuously patrols the world's oceans, silent, undetected, and ready to strike at any time. Another submarine is usually undergoing maintenance, and the remaining two are in port or on training exercises, ready to be deployed on short notice. Each Vanguard submarine carries approximately 40 warheads distributed between eight Trident missiles with a maximum range of 7,500 miles, and a destructive force equal to that of eight Hiroshima's. That's some serious destruction we are talking about. Although not nearly as potent as the U.S. strategic deterrent, the U.K.'s nuclear weapons are still sufficient to deter any adversary from launching a surprise attack. Generally, nukes evoke adequate fear, but still, if that's not enough for any potential invader, it will be a bloody ordeal to overrun the island. And to do so, they have to overcome the might of the British armed forces. 
The UK's military or the British armed forces is kind of a big deal when it comes to keeping the country safe from any potential invasion. With their well-equipped army, navy, and air force and highly trained personnel, it's no surprise they're one of the top military powers in the world. The British armed forces consist of the Royal Navy, the Royal Marines, the British Army, and the Royal Air Force collectively forming a strength of 190,170 personnel. While it may not match the scale of some other nations, however, they've got a long history of being excellent at what they do and can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with almost any army in the world, especially when we talk about its naval prowess. The Royal Navy has a long and storied history, which includes the famous defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588 and its dominance during the Napoleonic Wars. In Air Supremacy II, the United Kingdom reigns high and is a force to reckon with. It was the Royal Air Force or the RAF which turned the tide during the Battle of Britain back in 1940, which eventually forced Hitler to give up on his plans to invade Britain. In modern times, the combined British armed forces along with the Navy and the Air Force have only got better and stronger. Additionally, they also have access to some of the best military technology in the world, guaranteeing a high level of battlefield prowess for their armed forces. And that's not all. With 46% of the total population available as potential manpower, the number of British personnel can also be hugely increased, in times of war as seen during the First and the Second World Wars, when the British forces numbered 4.5 million and 4.9 million in 1918 and 1945, respectively. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be! Yeah. We shall fight! on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender! The United Kingdom also has several military bases throughout the world that not only help them maintain a forward presence, but can also provide several advantages in the event of a homeland invasion. As per research revealed by Declassified UK, the UK has a military presence in 145 sites in 42 countries, making it the second largest military network in the world, just after the United States, which has 750 foreign bases. These bases play a crucial role in the nation's security strategy and are strategically positioned throughout the globe such as here in Cyprus, Kenya, Bahrain, Singapore, the Falklands, and the list goes on. These bases help gather intelligence and conduct surveillance in regions of interest before an invasion takes place, and this intelligence can be invaluable in monitoring potential threats and planning defensive strategies. They can also serve as forward operating bases where military forces can be deployed, allowing for a quicker response to threats and potentially delaying an invading force. In the event of an invasion, these bases can also be used as logistical hubs for the transportation of troops, equipment, and other supplies, thus ensuring reinforcement, which can prove critical in sustaining a prolonged defense effort. This knowledge that the UK can project force and receive support from its overseas bases heavily dissuades any hostile actions from other countries. On top of these factors, it also helps that the UK has a pretty big war chest and invests approximately 55.5 billion British pounds or $68 billion per year on its military, making them the sixth largest spender globally. Invading a country with such a strong defense industry can prove to be a futile effort, not to mention that we have only discussed if the United Kingdom fights alone, which we all know will never happen. And that brings us to the next chapter. If there's one thing in which the United Kingdom doesn't come short is the list of allies. Firstly, it's a member of NATO, which is an international military alliance that consists of 31 member states from Europe and North America. NATO's banner flies proudly. Since the foundation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the communists have gained not one foot of new territory in Europe. NATO was founded April 4, 1949, by 12 nations of widely different languages and customs. During its six years, NATO has well proved its power for peace. It is a calm, studious approach to peace. It is a new approach. Never before in history have Europe's rival nations formed such a working alliance. The alliance is established on the principle of collective defense, meaning that an attack on one member is considered an attack on all members thereby ensuring that all members are committed to the defense of each other. 
So if the UK were to come under invasion or face any threat to its security, this would surely result in a collective response from all members which would also include military intervention. And that's a mountain that nobody wants to climb as NATO is by far the most powerful military force in the world. Now which country will go against an army that has more than 5 million total military personnel, 20,633 aircraft, 2,100 naval armadas, 1 million armored vehicles, 12,000 tanks and other military resources that are hard to put a cap on? Yeah, none, right? Apart from NATO, the UK also has a wide network of allies that would likely come to its aid if needed. Australia and New Zealand have long been staunch UK allies. Japan and South Korea also have good relations with Great Britain. Additionally, it is also a member of the Commonwealth of Nations, which is an international association of 56 countries mostly across Africa, South Asia, and the Caribbean. Although not a defensive alliance, the Commonwealth countries have fought alongside Britain in the past and would likely come to its aid if it was ever invaded. Ours is an association not just of shared values, but of common purpose and joint action. Forget NATO, forget the Commonwealth of Nations, and forget all the bilateral defense agreements that the UK has with numerous other countries. If there's a single nation that can wield the most significant impact should the UK require an ally in the event of a looming threat, it would undoubtedly be its long-standing and closest partner, the United States. I've come here today to reaffirm one of the oldest, one of the strongest alliances the world has ever known. It's long been said that the United States and the United Kingdom share a special relationship. And the reason for this close friendship doesn't just have to do with our shared history, our shared heritage, our ties of language and culture, or even the strong partnership between our governments. Our relationship is special because of the values and beliefs that have united our people through the ages. The relationship between our two nations is indispensable to the cause of liberty, justice, and peace. And a timely reminder of the proud history of our nation's share and the values, the values that we have long stood to, together to defend. That's the unshakable foundation of this special relationship, and it is a special relationship. There's no country closer to us than Great Britain. Today, as NATO allies, partners in innovation, as friends in a shared vision of the future, and the two nations, our two nations, are ready to meet the challenges of our time and meet them together. And I'm confident the United Kingdom and the United States will continue to lead the world toward greater peace, prosperity, and security for all. As for what the United States can offer, well, there's hardly any room for doubt. After all, they don't call you a superpower for nothing, right? Along with their military might and long list of allies, the United Kingdom also boasts an impressive intelligence network. And no, we are not talking about James Bond here, but various intelligence agencies such as MI6, GCHQ, and MI5, which work together to gather and analyze intelligence concerning the security of the United Kingdom. These agencies are responsible for monitoring global events and potential threats, and can provide early warning to the UK government about hostile intentions or military buildups by foreign powers, allowing the UK to prepare and respond accordingly. And we are well equipped to do that, and we have powerful agencies across government and powerful friends and allies. And most importantly, we have our values, which we cannot relinquish under any circumstances. It is also a member of the Five Eyes Alliance, which is an intelligence-sharing arrangement between five English-speaking countries, including the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. This alliance was originally formed during the Second World War and later formalized into an enduring intelligence-sharing partnership. It rests on the fact that when the chips are down, the five participants trust each other at a political and cultural level. It's a trust not just in the present generation of leaders of a country. It's a trust that goes down the generations. Now, the Five Eyes are really interesting in that there's a long history of shared language, culture, behavioral norms. Today, that's still as true as ever. To this day, the UK collaborates with its intelligence partners, including the United States and other Five Eyes members, to share information and intelligence on global threats, 
further strengthening the UK's situational awareness and response capabilities in case of an invasion. Another key reason why the UK is highly unlikely to face an invasion is simply because there are no enemies close enough. In order to launch an invasion of a country, it's important that the conquering force must control the strategic territory close by. Given that the UK is an island, this entails not only controlling France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Norway, and potentially Ireland as well, but also dominating the oceans around Great Britain. The last time anybody attempted to carry out such a task was during the Second World War, when Nazi Germany planned to launch Operation Sea Lion. However, due to the massive cost and threat of the British Royal Navy, the Germans opted for an aerial bombing campaign to weaken the country. That may have worked in the past, but with modern air defense systems such as the Sky Saber in place, it would be foolish to attempt in this day and age. It's also a near impossible task that anyone would be able to control these territories in the present time just like they did during the Second World War. Besides, all these countries maintain friendly and diplomatic relations with the United Kingdom. The reality is that the UK lacks any immediate hostile states that would engage in a war against it. Although tensions are high with adversaries such as Russia, China, and Iran, the prospect of entering into armed conflict with these nations is extremely remote. Even if they did, they are all thousands of miles away, and the vast geographical distance between them and the UK makes the notion of an invasion of mainland Britain almost impossible to imagine. To sum it up, Considering all the previous factors, we can say the United Kingdom is nearly impossible to invade, and even if it is tried, it could end up with a huge cost of lives, materials, and resources on both sides. Besides, modern conflicts are very different from the past. Rarely do nation-states go to war against each other. Of course, exceptions like Russia will always be there, but still, most countries fight their dispute through sanctions, espionage, and cyber and information warfare these days. They just don't see the advantages of going to war with other countries, especially against a major global power which the UK happens to be. However, even if we consider the difference between the past and the present, sure the politics, economics, and military technology may have evolved massively over the last centuries, yet the foundational elements that protect the United Kingdom remain in place which answers the question, why the UK is impossible to invade? Thanks for watching this video and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more similar content.